Okay, so the purpose of this video is going to be to go over the self-tracking and auto navigation code that I'm using on my robot this year. Uh, so first I want to go over this little robot I have in front of me. This is what I call my code bot, and I think this is a good idea that a lot of programmers in the VEX community could benefit from. As programmers, we often don't have a robot to test our code on, and that's one of the biggest difficulties. Throughout a lot of the season, we're actually working on building the physical robot itself. And I always tell my team what I really need to get the code working is like four or five hours to sit down with the finished robot and just work on code. And so eventually I just built myself my own little robot that I could test code on. So this robot has almost every sensor you could imagine. I've used most of the sensor ports and this is just something I can take home to test all kinds of code. Code for my robot, crazy stuff, cool projects I want to work on. So it's got encoders, it's got buttons, it's got gyroscopes. It's actually got two gyroscopes on it for my code. It's got light sensors and line followers. Uh, it used to have sonar on it. It's got an accelerometer. And this is the robot that I use so that I can get code work done while the real robot is being built. So the basis of the auto navigation code and the self-tracking code is that given a known starting, starting position um, and knowing where I move, then I can know where I am. And so how I figure out where I've moved is using these encoders and these gyroscopes. So if I know which way I'm facing, the encoders will give me a rotation, and using uh, the diameter of the wheels, I figure out the circumference, and that tells me how far I go with each rotation, and I can calculate the distance covered with each encoder tick. So if I know how far I've gone and the angle I've gone at, trigonometry will tell me um, my change in x and y coordinates, and knowing my start position, I can know where I now am relative to the start. The difficulty of this comes in when you consider that these are not straight line movements. The robot is not moving in a straight line. And traditionally, when people have tried this code, they've just assumed that the robot is moving in straight lines. And then they have uh, based their code on the fact that if the straight lines are small enough, if you take readings in small enough time intervals, intervals, you'll get these really, really tiny straight lines that when you add them together, you'll wind up with a pretty smooth curve. And that's true, but you're right off the bat guarante guaranteeing yourself some errors. So what I do instead is that I assume that the robot is always moving on a curve because never or very rarely is the robot moving in a straight line. The radius of that curve might be somewhere close to infinity, meaning that we're moving in almost a straight line, but it's always a curve, even if it's very, very slight. And so if we know the angle of an arc and we know the distance of that arc, uh, given those two things, we can calculate a ratio between the distance of the arc and the straight line distance of uh, of a line going from the two endpoints of that arc. And so knowing the angle of the arc that I get from my gyros and the distance of the arc, which is what the values coming out of my encoder are, I can calculate the straight line distance, which will give me a change in x and y coordinates. And this means that I have smaller errors than if you're assuming straight line distances. So the way the code works is that I... Um, Tell the robot where it is at the beginning of the match. So in this little demo, the robot is at facing zero degrees, facing zero degrees, which is this number. Its x coordinate is zero, which is this number, and its y coordinate is zero, which is this number. So what makes this kind of code different from traditional autonomous code is that it is what I would call a field-centric model, as opposed to a traditional uh, autonomous code, which is a robot-centric model. So what that means is that when I tell this robot to turn in autonomous, traditional code would say, turn 90 degrees to your left, to the left of which, whichever direction you're facing now. Instead, what I tell the robot is, turn to 90 degrees relative to the field. So in my example, zero, if you were standing in the driver, where the drivers stand, looking out towards where the audience would sit, towards the side of the field with the goals on it, zero would be directly towards your right. And 90 would be where the audience sits. So... 0 is that way, and 90 is that way. So I can press a button and tell the robot to turn to 90 degrees. And turning 90 degrees will always turn to that direction. If I were to turn the robot, it's not going to turn 90 degrees left again. Now it's going to turn 45-ish degrees right. So the model is based on the field, and so is my position. 
So if I move the robot now, drive it around, I can see that the XY coordinates displayed here have changed. I actually wound up pretty close to where I'm starting at. My XY coordinate is now 2, comma 3. But I can turn the robot and drive over here. My XY coordinate is now negative 13, negative 9. So when I use this code on the field, um, 0, 0, 0 or origin would be in the bottom left corner of the field. So you couldn't really go negative without going outside the field. But for this example, it's fine. And I hit that button, and the robot turns again to face 90 degrees. And it turns and faces exactly the same position as it did before. So where 90 degrees is hasn't changed because my robot's position and orientation has changed. Then I can hit a button, and it will ret return to where it started. And it, can't, it can do more than just return to where it started. It can go to any x, y coordinate on the field. In this case, for this example, that x, y coordinate is 0, 0. So just so you know, I'm not controlling the robot. I just press one button. And it returns to where it started, and it even faces the same direction it started. And you can see that it didn't follow the same path back to its starting spot that I drove to get over to here. It calculated the shortest possible path to get back to its starting location. And again, because this is field-centric, regardless of where the robot is, when I press that button, the robot returns to the same exact spot and faces the same exact angle. So the way I do this is that knowing where my robot currently is and knowing the XY coordinate I want to go to, in this case 0, 0, I can calculate um, using an arc tangent function based on the difference in X and Y between those positions, the angle to that position. And then I turn to face that angle and then I drive there with a power relative to the distance. And every six inches of travel, uh, the code has the robot recalculate the angle to the goal, reorient itself, and then continue driving. And this helps keep me on track. I can make adjustments as I move. The other really powerful part of this code is that if I know where I am, I also know where certain key field elements are. The robot knows where the red goal is, where the blue goal is. It knows where all the starting tiles, it, tiles are. Right now, amongst those, I can know where the goal is, I can calculate my, the angle between me and the goal, and I can turn there. That's what this button does. But unlike 90 degrees, the angle to the goal does change. In this case, if I'm starting at 0, 0 in the blue corner, the angle to the goal is 45 degrees. But that's not always true. That changes depending on my position on the field. So if I were to drive over here, the goal is no longer in the same position relative to my robot. With the press of one button, the robot turns itself towards the goal. So now instead of facing 45 degrees, it's only now facing 20 or so degrees because that's where the goal is relative to it. This is really powerful in that it allows me to autonomously aim the robot. And the entire idea is that the background code here, the auto navigation code and the self-tracking code, um, allows the robot to autonomously make decisions that I'm not very good at making. Especially in programming skills, this saves me from every time I want to face the goal having to calculate the angle to the goal and figuring out where it is relative to my robot and facing the goal. What's really powerful about a robot-centric model as opposed to a field-centric model is that I don't have to worry about my robot's current orientation or its current position. I can say, go to 0, 0 and face 0 degrees, and all by itself, the robot will do that. And I don't care which way the robot has to be, happens to be facing when I press that button or where it's located. It will always go there. And that takes a lot of work off of the driver and the programmer and allows the robot to make decisions. So the whole idea of my code this year is to give the robot as much information about its own state as possible to allow it to make as many autonomous decisions on its own as it can. So this year, my robot knows where it is where it's facing, it knows how fast its flywheels are spinning, sensors on the intake tell us how many balls the robot has taken up and picked up off the field. And knowing all this information allows the robot to autonomously make a lot of decisions. In doing this project, I've learned a lot about like the tremendous challenges facing people who are trying to program AIs. Because when you think about it, this is really just a stupid rudimentary artificial intelligence. They can figure out how to turn to a certain direction. 
one of the biggest challenges facing me early on this project that took me a while to solve was how to get a robot to take the shortest path in a turn. So if I tell it to turn to 90 degrees now, it turns to the left because that's the shortest path it can take. If I were to go over here now and tell it to turn to 90 degrees again, now it turns to the right because that's the shortest path. If I were to do that myself, I wouldn't even think about it. If I want to turn to a specific direction, I just turn the shortest way to get there. Um, but to go through that project that, but to go through that thought process that we do subconsciously and try and write it out in mathematical equations is something really, really interesting. And it was kind of just a really interesting thing for me to think about and wrap my head around. How do I make the decisions I make subconsciously? And how can I get a robot or a machine to make those same decisions mathematically? Uh, it was just a really interesting part of the project that kind of opened my eyes to some really cool parts of programming and trying to make machines have the same sort of logical thought processes that we do. And it was a cool challenge. Uh, there's threads on the VEX forum where we discuss a lot of this in great detail uh, and some of the methods I we use, and I will make sure to link those specific threads in the description. One of the greatest challenges with this type of code I have found is gyro drift. These suckers are terrible. Vex makes awful gyros. They drift all the time. So just a couple of tips if you want to make code like this yourself. Um, in order to prevent gyro drift, there's a couple of things you have to do. You can uh, manually enable these things in your code. And I will make sure that I give an example of how to do that in code. You can uh, manually enable these things. And you can also manually set something called sensor scale. And sensor scale changes for every gyro. But what that pretty much means is if sensor scale isn't set right, there's not necessarily going to be 360 degrees in a turn. If sensor scale is all wonky and you turn in a full circle, the gyros could read who knows what. But by carefully, carefully tuning the sensor scale of the gyros, you can arrive at so that you know when you turn a full circle, you will be at exactly 360 degrees. And it's important to very, very, very carefully tune this because... Um, if it's off by a little bit, maybe you'll get 360 degrees on the first turn, but the next turn, it'll be, you'll be at, instead of 720, you'll be at 722. And drift will accumulate over the course of a match. The other thing is that gyros are very sensitive to vibration. So if you see, I have my gyros here mounted on VEX rubber links, and that's kind of my sorry attempt at limiting the vibrations that affect these gyros. And the final thing is that, obviously, I have two gyros. By averaging the values, I can try and take out any error.